Okay, so you, you're, it's five after, so you have till 25 after. Okay. Okay? Please start. Okay. <clears throat> Again, good afternoon from the last session of today. Well, just to start with, I want to give a little background of what exactly is meat science and how are humans connected with the meat science in an overall fashion, be it physically, chemically, or biologically. So, <clears throat> My uh, research basically emphasizes on uh, the cooking strategies, the assorted ways of cooking um, treatments which are subjected to different pork samples uh, that are collected from different animals. And uh, how cooking can be a very important strategy to kill microorganisms when you consume it and when they go inside the human digestive system to, uh, to kind of have access to the micro and the macronutrients. So, <clears throat> moving on, as you know, pig is, a, is kind of a very old animal since, since human civilization had all started. And from the pig meat, there's a lot of kind of products that we can anticipate. And uh, it, it can be minced pork products, which is normally used in pasta. Uh, then you have different kinds of pork steaks, which is used kind of for delicacy in uh, kind of all the nations worldwide. So, <clears throat> what is our learning outcome today? Our learning outcome is to basically kind of showcast what kind of uh, cooking treatments are there for the different pork samples, why time and temperature is very important for kind of processing your meat. The third one is <clears throat> which temperature in your household or restaurants do you normally use so that you have proper digestibility. And the fourth and the most important one, what happens you don't have meat? Or you have meat in excess amounts. So there's two balancing sides that I'm going to discuss about. My research hypothesis emphasizes on does cooking of meat at different temperatures and time conditions, um, just mind you, these are the two most important factors, the temperature and the time. Because based on that, they use changes in the meat proteins, they denature them, they aggregate them, they oxidize them, and they again denature them further. And that affects the nutrition value. So this is what I'm going to talk about. So moving on, um, how can pig meat be different? That means right now I'm talking about the raw material, which is the pig meat. Now as you see, in different parts of Europe, as civilization existed and coexisted, there were diet formulations which changed the quality of the meat product, the taste, the texture, everything. <clears throat> the second important factor was the climatic factor because that influenced the amount of moisture that the pig meat had. The third was the geographical predisposition uh, which probably identifies species according to geographical locations. The fourth was natural breeding factors. And the fifth was selection rule by humans, which is artificial sometimes insemination and other genetic factors, which is induced through anthropogenic factors that influences the quality of the meat. So you see the picture here, as I pointed out, this is actually a Spanish hog, as they call it. And this one is a Danish hog. So you see the phenotypic characteristics, how different they are. How color, how, how uh, the, the, the variability in the weight, the variability in uh, the size, the variability in uh, each and every body part. It's very, very different. Apart from characteristics like color, or how big the ear is, or how big the nose is. <clears throat> Moving on. So, my, my small research project, well, it's a mini research project. Um, it deals with how I exactly take fresh meat samples from different pigs in and around Denmark, for sure. And I apply cooking treatments, which is the 58 degree for 72 minutes, uh, which is normally we use it in household. Uh, the 58 degree for 17 hour, this is the one that kind of mimics the conditions which is actually used in restaurants. The third one you see is 80 degree for 72 minutes, which kind of mimics products like sausages. And the fourth one is 160 degree for 72 minutes, which mimics uh, conditions like steak. Once you go to restaurants and you have steak, probably nice steak with vegetables and soup and stuff. So the methods that we have kind of utilized are 
the sous cooking treatment is a French, uh, very popular, very old way of cooking treatment in the water bath. And the next one is an oven where you can heat it up to 160 degrees centigrade and uh, set it for a particular time. So this is the way how I cook my meat samples. Now, moving on, I want to see what are the important significant chemical reactions that happen inside and the outside of the core of the meat. So it's a very common phenomenon that happens. The sugar uh, in the meat, okay, just, just to be uh, sure, an iconer is sugar kind of is in very limited content inside the meat product and it's not a glucose or a fructose molecule which is inside but it's basically something called ribose it's a 5c it's a 5 carbon sugar but it's very limited inside um, the meat and another adduct product which is inside the meat is glycogen okay but they're very limited you see so you have a sugar molecule and you have a protein molecule of course in the form of amino acids and they start getting to to have a mix they react and which is normally called a myelide reaction. That's when you see that the surface of that particular meat gets browner from what it is, from pink to brown. So you can have a little kind of representation. So this is the raw, okay? This is pink. So the myosin, which are kind of muscular uh, filaments, they're kind of intact, okay? There are lots of other proteins as well. But this is 58 for 72. You see a lot of water when I vacuum packed it, got stuck in. Okay. <clears throat> so slowly by slowly, as I'm trying to increase the temperature, they get kind of browner and browner until unless this becomes a disaster because it's 160 degrees centigrade for such a sample. And you see it's brown, really, really brown. So <clears throat> now the question that I want to pose is: Is this really good for our health or bad for our health? I'll come to it in a second. But as you see, the color variability kind of changes. So moving on um, is when you when you try to keep the pro, uh, the different food products at different temperatures and time, people want to see the food is colored. People want to smell it nice. Uh, and what the trick the myelin reaction kind of poses to us is when you start heating the food product, it offers new flavors. So there's certain simple compounds which try and get formation of Schiff's bases or amatory reagent products which are kind of aldehydes, certain complex molecules and they give an effervescent taste. So when you smell it, it, it it's good. So, and, and that's the reason that they want to try it off with different higher temperatures so that they can increase the sensory parameters of that particular food product. Uh, moving on, uh, here's a little assignment designed for you. As you can see, the raw and those samples kept there. So you can have a look at the product in pairs. And what I want you to do basically is, I want you to kind of uh, comment on the particular food product regarding three contexts. The first one is, please comment something about the color that you visualize. And these are the stuff. You can choose the white, pink, red, brown, or black. Then you, see, you look at the meat product closely and you comment about the texture, whether it's smooth, it's rough, it's crystalline or amorphous. And third, you define which of the meat products when you see that served in a plate, you want to have it, which one pleases you the most. So you have three minutes for it. And uh, you can take a piece of paper okay, on, in your notebook and write it down that which product from here would you like, based on color, texture, and which of the sensory attributes really attracts you? Like for eating or? For eating, yeah. You don't have to eat that, but it's just that which product do you really prefer? So, yeah. I have a question actually. You using the same uh, time, but why 72 minutes? So that you can have a balanced study design. Because when you publish papers, you need a balanced study design. Is that something you, that's you, standard or? That's, uh, yeah, you know, of course. You need to keep one parameter fixed and then you move on. Yes. Yeah, but why this number? Yeah, why this number? Sorry? Why 72 minutes? Oh, okay. Uh, because it's, it says that if you have this much amount of time, there's an enzyme inside the body which is called a caplase. And that's inside the meat production system. And what happens is around with 70, 70 minutes, it kind of gets activated. So that's why we've kept it at 72. 
You normally keep something like 70 to 75, so we can plot 72 is fine. Let's make an error to me. That's the primary result. Yes, so your time starts now. So it's three minutes you have. Take a piece of paper and just write it down. Two lines, three lines. Whatever you have a perception about each and every input. No, you can't stop because it's not as dangerous. I'm going to share it with Bob, why don't you join me? Bob, you can give it a try.
So here we are kind of delving deep into the strands, the protein strands, how complex it is and how does it break down. So here it is. Let's see, we have a native protein, which is actually the protein that withholds in itself the functionality of any particular, uh, let's say, a meat product. And once you give heat, let's say you give 70 degree heat, okay, you make it denatured. And again, if you cool it down, the structure reassembles itself and it forms again a native protein which might be functional, might not be functional, but that's the second issue. But, but the structure, re sorry? After the denaturation, protein natural goes back to the, most mm -hmm. of the times don't go back to the native uh, conformation. Yeah, of course, they don't go back because there's a lot of hydrogen bond rearrangement. Yeah. But some of the proteins do. But I'll come to that, I'll come to that. I have that in a picture. Okay, so you have the uncooked proteins. You have the uncooked proteins, she's right, actually. We have the uncooked proteins, and now you kind of make it into a 1D structure which is a cooked protein uh, network, yeah. So, <clears throat> once you cook it down and you make the strand simplify, you want to activate your pepsinogen, which is kind of inactive. So once it gets and triggers itself in the human digestive system, the pepsinogen becomes something called pepsin. This is very active. And it kind of functions at a pH level of 3 to 5 in acidic environments. And they go and trigger against the most predominant protein in the meat first, which is called myosin. Okay, it's a very complex molecule, lots of heavy chains, lots of uh, light chains, but I'm not coming to that. But there's a docking pattern in which you see how much it can hold to how much it can bind. Uh, that kind of influences the digestibility in the human uh, tract system. But with further evidence, what FDA and EFSA says, EFSA, it says that every day, if you have a 2000 calorie diet, a regime, uh, you must have 50 grams of protein. That's what the RDI input accounts for, the required daily intake. So, <clears throat> let's say, when, when he chose those samples and when we had discussion of who likes what kind of products, uh, you see, so when it kind of gets inside the stomach, and now you see, basically, yes, so they go inside the duodenum, okay, and here what takes place is something called reabsorption of the nutrients. Not reabsorption, sorry, my mistake, it's absorption of nutrients, okay, and they can dissipate around, around and it kind of dissipate around through the water channels, through pouring molecules and stuff. So from this, we what the conclusion that we derived is 160 degrees centigrade is dangerous one because it it's it's as you can see it's brown and it leads to formation of carcinogenic compounds which are called acrylamides and they're cancer causing. So that's not good for your health. So the one after a lot of experimentation that we have kind of deduced is 58 for 72 is the best because it's the one that you normally use in the household um, in, a, in, in a household environment. And uh, <coughs> uh, low temperature, low time, you try to change the structure of the protein, which kind of makes them modify. Not only that, you make them active uh, binding sites for the enzymes that basically kind of naturally function in the human digestive system. Uh, so here what happens. You have a colon cancer when you have, you know, like brown, because you have something called acrylamides. It's a colon cancer. But what happens when your protein intake is low? When your protein intake is low, you have two most uh, kind of dominant diseases all around the world. Statistics says three percent of the entire world population. So the first one is sarcopenia, where your muscles eat yourself. That means your body becomes parasitic to itself. It eats on its own muscle. So as you see, the diameter of your muscle decreases considerably. It's around one to two centimeters that happens. So it's kind of pretty intense. The second one is Alzheimer's disease in which your kind of certain body parts, you know, kind of gets out. They don't function. Your memory power gets kind of, you know, uh, loosened out. You're kind of short of everything, can't remember everything. Certain symptoms which kind of decide what's happening. So I have a question. Yes. Alzheimer's, you mean that it's related to undernutrition? One of the factors. 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah, sure. It's a genetic impulse. So it's a part of a segment which encodes for an AAD gene. That's what I remember from the literature. And this gene is due to food impulse. It's a okay, neurological the gene. food psyche. Yeah. Can you explain again the gene? Yeah. The name of yes, the name of the gene is called AAD. 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 That's a gene that encodes for uh, certain functionality of the proteins that work for. Because <clears throat> thing is, if your brain says remember, let's say, uh, you have a particular gene for it, but they block the transcriptase. They block the trans translational enzymes, and that's why the proteins don't get formed properly. But the Alzheimer gets formed by the plaque it's kind of starting to agglomerate mm -hmm. in the, the Yeah, I said it's one of the factors. Anyway, okay. Yes. And, and you're, you're out yeah. of time. So. Yes. And thank you so much for listening. So cook smartly and eat healthy. Okay. Yeah. Okay, everyone go ahead and give uh, some useful feedback. Uh, do you have something to write on? Yeah.